Hi there, I'm Robin Chakra, and you find me at the Foodies Festival in South Parks in Oxford. I'm outside the Appleton Rum bus. Now I do know the best places to take you. We're going to go in and talk to Ian Burrell, who is the global ambassador for the rum industry in the West Indies. I'm very much looking forward to this. We're going to talk to him about the state of the industry and what it's all about. Come with me. Good of you to give me a little bit of your time at this uh, wonderful foodies festival going on here. Um, well, that's the joy, isn't it? I I know little about rum, you know, but can I can we talk a little bit about first of all about you? Yeah. Um, I I believe you were actually born in the West Indies, is that right? No, I was actually born in London, but uh, my my parents are from Jamaica, and uh, in fact, my mum used to say that inside this house is Jamaica and out there is England. So it felt like he was born in the Caribbean uh, with two uh, Jamaican parents and speaking patois inside the house. So, but yeah, but I'm. Fortunate to have two citizenships of Jamaica and Great Britain. Right, I understand. And you you have this rather wonderful role they call the global ambassador for rum, which I sus which I have a suspicion you probably developed yourself. Is that right? I did indeed. Yeah, no one actually officially appointed me as a global ambassador, but um, I was I was actually a rum ambassador for a particular rum company, a Jamaican rum company, Appleton, and um, and they and help helping them to launch around the world actually got me to realise I didn't know anything about rums. I knew about Appleton rums, but not about other rums. So while traveling around the world, learning about the category of rum and learning how people drank it and how I wanted to actually teach people about it, I developed the global rum ambassador uh, persona and uh, it stuck with me. That's what the media now call me. I think it's an absolutely brilliant name and I can't think why on earth everybody isn't trying to do that with some other product. No, okay, no, it's an absolutely brilliant yeah. Where's the vodka ambassador? Where's the gin ambassador? <laughs> I might work on that one. We'll see how it goes. Um, Ian, tell me a little bit about the history of the rum industry in the West Indies because it's complicated and it goes back a very long way indeed. Back indeed, a long way. In fact, the history of rum in the West Indies is like the history of Great Britain, Spain, Portugal, France, any of the empires actually um, went to the New World to basically expand their empire because rum was an important part of, of cash flow uh, as well as sugarcane and molasses. So the history of rum is the history of Europe as such. Um, I always like to say one of the reasons why Great Britain was great because they had a lot of countries that produced rum. Yeah, well, that seems absolutely fair enough. So it stems from the sugarcane plantations, yes. which were presumably not planted specifically for rum. No, no, there was, uh, uh, sugar was the main cash crop. If you had land that could grow sugar, you were uh, basically rich. If you were a landowner that had sugar, you could sell to various different other governments and countries. You were a wealthy, a wealthy Oscar millionaire at that particular time. Now, rums were made from the leftover was all byproduct of making sugar but then it became so important it actually became the main cash crop so sugar was the subsidiary to rum um, over the course of time but initially it was just making rum from the leftovers from molasses of making sugar right so uh, tell me a little bit about how it's made I you I can I can see that you got the, the molasses you've created a, a, a sugary environment yes, right. how, and you presumably uh, well, you tell me how it then works well rum is like any other spirit first of all you had your raw material and the raw material for rum is any byproduct from sugarcane. So it has to be either fresh sugarcane juice, syrup, or molasses. And what you do is then you ferment that. You ferment that for a couple of days, it becomes alcoholic as the natural yeast or your own um, propagated yeast actually starts to eat those sugars. It becomes alcoholic, eight, nine percent alcoholic, and then you distill it. The same way as any other spirit, you distill it to strip away all the other products, get it, purify it, get it up to like 80, 90 percent alcohol by volume, and then stick it in a barrel, and then you've got your, your rums. That's it. Now, so the, your, the stuff you're putting in the barrel is presumably crystal clear. It is. It and, is right. But it has flavors that you don't get from grain spirits. That's, that's very true. They say that a lot of pure rums, um, you can taste the raw material. In fact, that's one of the specifications of, of rum. You have to be able to taste the raw material, which is the sugar cane. So when you distill it, you want to distill it to anything less than, say, 95% alcohol by volume. Um, and then you can still taste some of the properties. If you really want to get the flavor of the rum, use a pot still. 
pot stills for me are the king. They're the old style of making spirits. Single malts use it, cognacs use it, uh, tequilas use that as well. Um, use a pot still, you're getting a, um, a lower alcohol by volume yield, but you're getting so much flavor in that white spirit before you stick it inside a barrel to actually get it some color and even more flavor. I, I remember, I'm interested you should describe that because I remember the uh, master blender of Appleton. Oh, I think yes. it's called Joyce Spence. Joyce Spence yes, she, yes, she's an amazing woman, but she, I, I, I know one or two of these sorts of people who are very oh, specifically good at that yes. that particular kind of job. They're, yeah. they're a very strange bunch that I, are, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm hugely full of admiration for them. But um, uh, she mentioned that the stills themselves, you, I believe Appleton's, for example, yes. have two specific pot stills yes. that she they use to make their rum, right. that they, in fact, instill a certain citrus quality to this. Like an orange peel note. Um, um, and, it, and it is the design of the steel. It's the copper uh, inside there as well that reacts with the actual distillation as well, takes away all those sulfury uh, notes that you don't want, the undesirable notes. And the way the steel is, is created and the way they actually uh, run their stills does give a certain quality. It gives a certain signature note. That's why one of their rums is called a signature blend and that's a signature note that Appleton tried to have and instill all through their rums. But that orange peel note is significant too. Uh, the Appleton estate. Yes, that's that's extremely interesting. So, okay, well, we've still got this liquid that comes out of the end of that still, uh, if you'll forgive me saying so, gin clear. Um, oh, <laughs> at least you didn't say vodka clear. No, well, that's right. No, I stay, stay clear from that. water white. <laughs> water white is a good one. I'll try to remember that. Um, then it goes into a, a maturation period. Presumably. Yes, it goes into a maturation period. Now, the thing is with, with Jamaica, uh, you don't actually have to age your rums to be called rum. In some countries, say like a, a Cuba, Puerto Rico, you have to age rum before it can be called rum um, if it's not aged or it hasn't seen any wood it's called aguariente basically like a, a fire water as such that's a little like whiskey which uh, can't be called yeah. whiskey until it's been aged for some exactly years. exactly and jamaica fortunately can sell unaged rums as such and still call them rums but all of the best tasting rums a lot of people would like to would say all the smoothest rums are the ones that have seen wood so they'll mature it inside um, once used american oak casks um, that bourbon's been in for what um, for a couple of years and then the bourbon's been slung out or drunk <laughs> we get the barrels at a cheap rate and then stick rum inside there and that's where it develops its color and its complexity and it picks up some of the vanilla from the from the oak and, it picks up and some natural vanillins and notes and picks up some natural sugars as well because they burn the inside of the barrels so what it does it caramelizes natural sugars inside the wood and some of that flavor is imparted inside inside the actual rum and we also pick up other notes that we um, assume are things like caramel and <clears throat> toffee and leather and tobacco it's a range of different um, flavors and uh, aromas that we pick up from an aged and matured rum and that's brilliant so they experiment with the, the barrels themselves presumably and they where do. they come from and so on they do yes american oak is the is the most popular but now a lot of rum companies are using uh, limousine oak casks from cognac um, they're using other european woods using sherry and whiskey uh, sherry casks and wine casks as well for, for their various different types of vinegar. i've noticed quite a lot of more wine casks being used for, for several well. spirit maturation that seems to be working nicely so okay well this is so it sounds like an absolutely glorious product it has an almost unlimited range of possibilities that's right that's if when how important is it now to the economy of the region Oh, it's immensely, it's so important. I used, I used to love to think, when I used to work with Appleton directly, I used to love the fact that every bottle of rum that was sold is contributed to the economy inside the country. Because Appleton is a big employer of Jamaicans on the island, whether it's they're working on the plantations and the sugar plantations, whether they're working in the distillery or the aging warehouse, in communications. It's it's so important. And it's not only uh, Appleton and Jamaica, it's, it's Barbancor in Haiti, which employs 80% of the workforce on the island uh, indirectly. Um, so the the, the rum industry for the tropical regions for the Caribbean is an important part of the economy and that's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about selling uh, rums from the tropics <clears throat> and especially rums from the Caribbean. Yes. I mean that makes a, a massive difference. So now tell me then in that case how to what extent is the market growing in the rest of the world? Obviously down to you to a degree because you, you now travel, you travel the world, you give rum presentations around the world. I know that you do this and certainly in Europe and occasionally elsewhere. Um, it, the market presumably is growing everywhere, is that right? The market is growing. A lot of people are understanding that rums are not just the basic spirit you mix with your favorite mixer. With, and rum and coke is still a very, very popular bar call. They're now discovering there are some really good sipping rums. Um, and these are rums that are either been aged and matured um, for 
vast amounts of time in the Caribbean and they and they equate to any of the cognacs or malt whiskies out there as, um, to a lot of consumers so that's great that they're actually putting themselves in that mindset and a lot of rums now as I said are now being developed and aged in various different finishes with different casts so there are limited edition rums uh, certain rums where you might get like 500 bottles that are aging like a particular sherry cast so all the connoisseurs are now um, are seeking and looking out looking out for these particular these blends of rums so it's great to see the premium sector growing and and it's I would say it's nice to see the lower sector still there but it's not growing at the same rate as the premium sector now that's very interesting so and that gives opportunities to small distilleries because that's, that's exactly. the key really isn't it yeah, exactly and that's that's why I'm excited about it it does, it does give a chance to the smaller distilleries to compete on that level because their economy of scales is not going to be as big as say like a, a big massive company like say let's say Bacardi which is the biggest rum brand in the world and a small brand a small company in say uh, Grenada that's making premium rums still will have their market because they're not going to compete with the Bacardis on the on the lower end uh, because of that economy of scale but they can compete in the premium sector because they know that they have a, uh, a market that is looking for premium and good quality rums. It's absolutely fascinating. It sounds like a wonderful time for the rum industry. Oh, yeah. Now you you started a thing called the Rum Fest which is yes. uh, which you uh, happens in London I think. So. Happens in London yeah um, <clears throat> so I started that this will be our 10th one so I started that back in 2007. Um, but I've influenced rum festivals all over the world, um, from Spain to France to Germany to Miami. Um, I've helped set up a rum fest in Hong Kong, Mauritius, uh, Czech Republic. Um, there's rum fest all over the world now, and, and, and it's just bringing people together to enjoy the category of rum. This is such an achievement, Ian. I mean, it really is. It's quite extraordinary. This I do congratulate you. But I mean, uh, we must. Uh, we will, if we, if we may, we'd like to come to one of your, oh, your we'll next do. rum fest and, rum fest, and bring, the have a look. bring these guys here. These guys here. I will bring. I will bring <laughs> yeah. these two lovely. Uh, they look, they look too young. Though. I don't think they can. Drink <laughs> that, they can have some water. <laughs> they've been having. They've been having trouble with your bar staff all morning. But yeah, please come down. It's uh, we have like over 400 rums to sip and savor. We have master blenders from all over the world. Joy Spencer will be there this yeah. year, so you can have a little tic tac with her. Wonderful. We have master blenders from South America, Central America, from from France as well. Yeah. Um, that buy and blend rums from all over the world. We have distillers, we have brand ambassadors, we have two thousand people over the two days just sipping and savoring and really enjoying the category of rum master classes. We show show how versatile rums are, like rum and chocolate pairings, rum and food. We've got people like Levi Roots coming up and showing how he cooks with rum. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. so it's it's such an entertaining day and even if you don't drink yeah. it's, it's it's a wealth of knowledge uh, to learn about the rum category at oh, Rumfest. Yeah. I'm, I'm always the only person who doesn't drink at these sorts of events. And it, <laughs> no, and since, well. <laughs> I'm always making sure everyone else is enjoying themselves. It's absolutely yeah. terrifying. So since I've got involved in the spirit world oh, yeah. I find that it's, I've, I've been doing wine tastings all my life. Well, yes, I now right. don't get to drink anymore. It's, <laughs> it's a terrible shame. But Ian I'm really grateful to you for your time. Thank you so much. No, no, and thank you. Uh, thank you. I think we're going to do a little tasting yeah. later on with me. We are. Well, yeah. That one of my my roadshow tastings yeah. here at the foodies. We, well, that'll be very enjoyable. We look forward to that. And thank you so much for your time. No problem. Cheers. Take care. If you'd enjoyed yourselves too, please subscribe to our channel or follow us on Facebook or tweet if, if you'd like to. Next week we'll be doing something else. We're not quite entirely certain what yet, but we will certainly be putting something else up. And on a regular basis, we'll be putting up our cookery channel as always. Goodbye. Yeah.